Okay, beginning the book of Exodus today. I'm talking of books. There's a quick update for you on the commentary, in which I can actually do something called waggling. <laughs> As in waggling the book. Is it finally... Um, it's been printed. We wanted to check that when it was printed, it was as it should be before putting the link up. The link will be in the description. JP was satisfied with how it turned out, so it's now available. There's an idea of what it looks like in the middle. <clears throat> I think it's good because the writing's big, and if you've got squinty face eyes like me, then you can see it properly. And we've all commented on the fact that it feels nice to touch. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite quite voluminous, as you can see. Right then, <clears throat> good stuff, eh? So, as I say, today we start the book of Exodus. The Israelites are dwelling in the land of Egypt, and um, <clears throat> we've seen how Yaakov and Israel came to be in Egypt. We saw Joseph's rise to power in the land of Egypt. Interpretation of the dreams brought before the Pharaoh when the cup bearer remembers all about that guy he met in prison. And there he is, Yosef, tells him it's going to be bountiful and end famine. So it's all the idea he tells him is to make provision. As a result of this, the Pharaoh says, you know, seem to be a smart young chap. And he puts him in charge of the whole earth. And then seven years of famine began to come. Just as Joseph had said, there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. Then we have Yosef, the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And then we see um, the brothers being sent again um, after their first journey <clears throat> to the land, um, trying to take back the money that was in their sacks. They arrange Joseph's there, and he sets a little trap for them, and puts the goblet in the... Um, the sack of Benjamin, <clears throat> they stopped on their way back, and it's found, and then they tore their clothes. Every man loaded his donkey, they returned to the city, and Joseph accuses them and says, what have you been up to? And says he's going to put uh, Benjamin in as his servant. And Judah, unaware that he stood before Joseph, offers himself in Benjamin's place. And we've seen how Jehovah refines his people through all the things that occur, and Judah here shows evidence of true repentance. Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. They came near and he said, I am your brother Yosef, who sold you into Egypt, whom you sold into Egypt. And now don't be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. And he says, hurry up and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Yosef, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You should be near me. You and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. We looked um, past your Vyagas, what this points us to. He says, there I will nourish thee. There you have five years of famine to come, so that you and your household, all that you have, do not come to poverty. Yosef made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and presented himself to him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. So this incredible um, series of events unfolds. <coughs> The descendants of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were sheltered, provided for by Yosef from Pharaoh's own granaries and coffers in a land called Goshen. And then what does the Torah tell us of their state? Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen. They gained possessions in it, were fruitful, and multiplied greatly. And Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the days of Yaakov, the years of his life, were 147 years. As I've mentioned, um, when I've done this previously, what happened to the idea of going home after the famine was over? Seems to have got a bit settled in Egypt, don't they? 17 years, the father, it says, was there in the land. Seems they all got a bit comfortable in Egypt. Now, when he died, Yaakov was given a state funeral. And we finished the book of Genesis with this verse. So Yosef died being 110 years old. They embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So... Oh. <clears throat> That's where we were up to. Today's Parsha begins. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Yaakov, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Ishika, Zebulun, and Benjamin. <laughs> Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. 
all the descendants of Yaakov were 70 persons, and Yosef was already in Egypt. Then Yosef died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Well, Yosef had purposely planted his father's family in the land of Goshen, and there they could live a set-apart life from the Egyptians. And it was a place where they could continue their lives as shepherds, caring for their flocks. Um, does Exodus 1-7 maybe imply that many of the Israelites left Goshen and, as it says, filled the land? Not all of the land of Egypt was conducive to raising sheep. Um, had many of the sons of Israel separated from the family and acquired other occupations and move away from being shepherds that gained them wealth as defined by Egypt? As we've noted, the Torah makes statements concerning a person's character when it gives their occupation. The righteous are characterized as being shepherds and sojourners. So, <clears throat> is it implied, is the point I'm making, that somehow they got a little bit too settled? They were supposed to go back, but they were like, oh, we like it here. Some of them perhaps even deciding to no longer be shepherds, which as we've seen, is a suggestion as a move away from righteousness. Do we see a hint here that the people went on to lose their set of partners to walk in an unrighteous manner? A manner more Egyptian, which as we see in scripture is like an idiom for the world. So are they becoming more worldly? The suggestion is borne up by the fact that by the time we come to this week's Parsha, things have turned against them. Things did not remain comfortable for the Israelites. And today we'll be introduced to a people in bondage. Exodus 1. The children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, suggesting a time of favor is at an end, and then sure enough, in verse 9, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So indeed, there is this suggestion that they were spreading out and filling the land. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. These events are described by the psalmist. It says, when he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread... He'd sent a man ahead of them, Yosef, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron. Until what he had said came to pass, the word of Jehovah tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions, to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel came to Egypt, Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and Jehovah made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes. And then it says, he turned their heart to hate his people. So Jehovah did this. And in different translations, you'll see, he turned their hearts to deal subtly with his servants, or to conspire against his servants, or to deal craftily with his servants. And it says, he sent Moshe and his servant and Aaron, whom he had chosen, and they showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham, which is what we'll see unfold as we go through the book of Exodus. So Jehovah, the creator of all things, turned the hearts of the Egyptians to hate his people, to deal craftily with them. <coughs> Perhaps this does indeed suggest that his people had gotten too comfortable in Egypt and needed a little prod. I don't know, just a suggestion. In today's Parsha, we're going to be introduced then to Moshe. Jehovah will introduce himself to Moshe, and Jehovah will tell Moshe of his plans to deliver his people from Egypt. And then as we move on, we'll see these um, plagues sent unto the land of Egypt. Then we have the story of the deliverance of Jehovah's people, which points us to Yeshua, the Lamb of God. We ultimately come to Passover, don't we? 
But it all points us to Yeshua, our Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And it is good to recall the deliverance that occurred on the first Passover night. Indeed, in Exodus 12, it says, It was a night of watching by Yehovah to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to Yehovah by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Significant these events are, and we're to remember them. Um, we're commanded to, indeed. And we see the command to remember throughout Scripture. Exodus 13, Moshe said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand, Jehovah brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Um, indeed, the ten words begin like this. God spoke all these words, saying, I am Jehovah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Leviticus 11.45 I am Jehovah, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Deuteronomy 5.15 You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Jehovah your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So, remember it. Goes on to say, therefore, Jehovah your God has commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You were a slave in bondage to sin in the land of Egypt, represented by the world. And Jehovah your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Um, and these are things that we are to remember John 17, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world, yours they were. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Um, <clears throat> speaking of the fact that when we are his, we're separated, we are taken out of the world, just like the Israelites were taken out of Egypt. So do not forget all that Jehovah has done for you. He has redeemed you and called you out of the world. Do not forget what he did for your ancestors when he brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 6. And when Jehovah your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget Jehovah who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is Jehovah your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. And when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that Jehovah our God has commanded you? Then you shall say, son, <clears throat> we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and Jehovah brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And Jehovah showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And Jehovah commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Jehovah our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before Jehovah. Our God as he has commanded us. So take care lest you forget Jehovah who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is Jehovah, your God, you shall fear. Which is a call to righteousness as we'll see. We're commanded to remember these events. And we are to remember what they point us to as well. The account of the Exodus gives us a great picture of what it is to be delivered and saved. Deliverance released from bondage by the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> so, it's good that we, um, we get to go through these parshas again and have all this um, brought to the forefront of our minds. And um, <clears throat> what it points us to is the gospel, which is not often um, known in Christian churches, um, but... This is a brief summary. Hasatan is the power of death and we sinned. He held his power over us. The soul that sins dies, as we know. But Yehovah ransomed us from the hands of one stronger than us. And Yeshua died to pay our ransom. 
He'd want me to want. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Um, So as we go through the Exodus account, just be aware of what it is that it points us to. Now, to remember, Zakar is a powerful thing. It means not passive recall, but active commemoration to to periodically celebrate something like one's marriage vows on an anniversary or your birth on a birthday. It means to bring the event being remembered to the forefront of your mind, to focus intently upon it and to see it clearly and appreciate its significance. The enemy will not want you remembering all the great things that Yehovah has done for you, but at any time you feel like you can't cope, take a moment and zakah, focus intently and all the victories that Yehovah has given you. We see here, uh, Moshe speaks words of encouragement to those who are about to go in and take possession of the land. He says, if you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? In this moment of like doubt and fear and, oh, this might go badly. He says, you shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what Yehovah your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which Yehovah your God brought you out. So will Yehovah your God do to all the peoples of whom you're afraid. And for me, this translates to if you ever have this scary moment or you're in doubt or fearful or anything like that or anxious, just think how incredible Yehovah's love is for you that he delivered you, he rescued you, you were ransomed. And then also I will think of all the things in my life that I've seen that are incredible where Yehovah has done the seemingly impossible and it puts things in perspective. Just like those Moshe addresses, we're also called to remember them. Serpent will try to screw your memory or skew your memory. Remember his approach to, oh, so he knocked that off. Sorry. His approach to Eve, he started it all by asking, did God truly say? He was testing whether she could recall not only Yehovah's actual instructions, but also their context and their essential meaning. Now, when it comes to the word, don't suffer as some do from a selective memory. The commandments of remembering empower us to put everything that happens in our lives into proper perspective. To forget is not good. The etymology of forget means to forget due to distraction or inattention. This word it is here. To forget Yehovah Elohim is to not keep his commandments. Deuteronomy 8.11. To forget Yehovah Elohim is to follow other gods. To forget Yehovah is to live in fear of harm and danger. To live freshly and timidly. To forget Yehovah is to live in rebellion. Those who forget are contrasted with those who walk uprightly in Psalm 50. They described as those who hate discipline, those who cast Yehovah's words behind them in verse 17. And then in verse 22, Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show salvation of God. Now that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because if you do have the practice of remembering then what will come um, from that is thanksgiving. The danger of forgetting Yehovah, danger, uh, in Deuteronomy 4, take care lest you forget the covenant of Yehovah your God which he made with you and make a carved image, the form of anything that Yehovah your God has forbidden you. For Yehovah your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 8.19 And if you forget Yehovah your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Forgetting Yehovah seems to be directly correlated to looking to the other nations and adopting their ways and worshipping their gods. Becoming more wildly, more Egyptian, you might even say. After Joshua's generation had died in Judges 2, we read, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Yehovah and served the Baals. They abandoned Yehovah, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods, oh, from the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked Yehovah to anger. They abandoned Yehovah and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. 
So comfortable Israel tends to forget Yehovah and go after other gods. Comfortable Israel tends to do what is abominable in Yehovah's eyes. How much greater than the danger to those who live in exile. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Oh. Sorry, the, the screen's gone off. Um, which... Oh. Yeah, I think that might that might be a problem. It um, the projector, uh, which war, uh, which wage war against your soul. Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Paul puts it really well in his letter to Titus for all those who are looking forward to Yeshua's return. Since the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who was zealous for good works. So, our great Savior, Yeshua, gave himself for us to redeem us, to ransom us from all lawlessness. And we read in Isaiah 53, uh, he was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah so 52, as many were astonished that the, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. <clears throat> Indeed, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is, before its sheared is his silence, so he opened not his mouth. Psalm 22. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. <clears throat> he trusts in Yehovah, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And this is <clears throat> our Messiah. We're not to forget, we're not to forget the events that we will cover in the book of Exodus. We're not to forget what they point us to. From Titus 2, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Yeshua gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. We must never forget. Scripture warns us of the dangers of forgetting whilst also encouraging us to time and time again to remember, because to remember to Zakar is a powerful thing. Yehovah has told us to remember the Sabbath and to cherish, treasure and carefully guard its holiness. We're told to remember all the instructions of Torah every time we look at tzitzit. A big thanks to Emily for the tzitzit that she passed on through Mel. Um, mine are brilliant. <laughs> Everybody else is our team. <laughs> I really like my one. We are told to remember the day in Egypt when we sprinkled the blood of the lamb on our doorposts and the death angel passed over us. As we read in Deuteronomy 5.15, we are told to remember that we were once slaves in Egypt but have been brought forth from bondage by his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. And of course, we do remember all the events that took place that we read about, but we rarely grab hold of what it means to us as well. Yehovah has ransomed Yaakov and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him, delivered. It is good for us to remember that we've been rescued. There is no greater demonstration of Yehovah's love for us. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yehovah told us to remember the deliverance he wrought for us and how he crushed our enemies at the Sea of Reeds. In Deuteronomy 8, we read that Yehovah tells us to remember how he led us through the wilderness and that it is him who gives us the ability to produce wealth. We read, You shall remember the whole way that Yehovah your God has led you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. The test is always the same. It's about whether you'll keep the commandments or not. And in verse 3, it says, Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yehovah. Which brings us to the Messiah again. The crowds come to Yeshua after he had fed the 5,000. 
This is in John 6. Our father, and he says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Yeshua said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moshe who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Luke twenty two nineteen. he took bread, he said, this is my body which is given for you. This is obviously the last supper. Yeshua, the word made flesh, the bread of life. Let us not forget that Jehovah gave his son whose body was broken, that we might have life and life eternal and life to the full. Yeshua is the bread of life, the bread that came down from heaven for us. In Deuteronomy 8.3, it says, Man does not live, but we just read it, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Jehovah. Yeshua is the bread of life. He is the word made flesh. He said to pray, give us this day our daily bread, which I think is interesting. In Exodus 16, we read, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I might test them whether they may walk in my law or not. <clears throat> In the Hebrew it reads, gather a word in it today, or you could say, give us our daily bread. <clears throat> Interesting with Yeshua praying, give us this day our daily bread. And what it speaks of is always looking to Yeshua and always walking in his word. Man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And the word brings life, the word brings faith. Romans ten seventeen. faith comes by hearing or shimmering and shimmering by the word of God. Faith brings salvation, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Consider then those who had no faith, um, as is described of the first generation of the people who left Egypt and would die in the wilderness. These are people who said, now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. And of course, as I say, they died in the wilderness. <clears throat> the manna representing the word was also maligned by those of the second generation. Numbers 21, the people spake against God and against Moshe. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. And Jehovah sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. I've pointed out before the word the Torah uses is not the typical word which actually means to send but means something closer to he let go or he released the fiery serpents. Therefore the people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moshe prayed for the people. So, these are the people who've just said, our soul loathes this light bread, which is an awful complaint they made against the bread. It's the divine manna from heaven. The rejection of it brought about immediate judgment from Yehovah. As we've seen, Yeshua, the word made flesh, compared himself to this bread. And sadly, there are many who cry out, our soul loathes this light bread. And people have no idea that when they turn from Yehovah's word, that they are turning from Yeshua, the bread of life and effectively making the same complaint. And it's often not so much by the words that come out of their mouths, of course, that folk declare our soul loathes this light bread, but rather by their actions, by the choices they make. People who are not surrendered will always find ways to facilitate not walking in obedience, won't they as well? <clears throat> um, whilst somehow with their words pretending that they do. 
Indeed, so many walk in sin, driven by desires, led away by various lusts. They may like to go to listen to the word, as say, but it doesn't have a positive effect on them. They only hear what they want to hear. They do not do it. Effectively, their soul loathes this light bread. It's not enough for them. They want something else. Man, again, oh, the word again. Give me something else, something different. And if they're to be judged like these people, they are wicked and they will die. If we continue on in that tale, the Lord said to Moshe, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it up on a pole, a standard, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, whom he looks upon it, shall live. <clears throat> Today in repentance we look to Yeshua. John 13, As Moshe lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. And if we go back to John 6, we see the importance of never taking our eyes off Yeshua. Yeshua said to them, I'm the bread of life. And then he says this, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Moshe made this serpent to brass. He put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Again, we see the Torah pointing us to Yeshua. Um, <clears throat> I think it is an amazing thing to be able for us as his people. We can do it together and we can do it um, when we're on our own is to look to our Messiah, um, remember what he's done for us, but to really take time to appreciate um, all that he's done for us, that we would be a people of thanksgiving, not a people who moan, who loathe this light bread. Deuteronomy 8 continues and says, And when you shall eat and be full, you shall bless Jehovah your God for the good land he's given you. And um, <clears throat> there seems to be, this is like before the demise of Israel, there's always this lack of appreciation for what Jehovah has done. And he's saying, don't be these people. Take care lest you forget Jehovah your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and you live in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be filled up and you forget Jehovah your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. And of course, <clears throat> the situation we see as we come to the book of Exodus, is a people who've um, at some point have waxed um, many and have multiplied and all these things. And yet, perhaps there's a suggestion that they have, in the process, forgot Jehovah, hence ending up in this situation of slavery. Who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground, where there was no water. <clears throat> he brought you water out of the flinty rock. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. They were forced to rely upon Jehovah, weren't they? Please note, it says, Jehovah led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents. There's only one other place where we find fiery serpents mentioned in the Torah. A place that mentions the desert, the manna, and the water supply too, when we read it just earlier. The people spake against God and against... Oh, I think there's a problem. Oh, yeah, it got knocked. Um, wherefore, against Moshe, wherefore you have brought us up out of the land of Egypt to die in the wilderness... There is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loads this like bread. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. As we said, this word actually means to release or let go, which means Jehovah didn't send snakes. He didn't command them to go and attack the people. He let them go. He removed his protection that the people weren't even aware that they were under. <clears throat> and I often think about under what? protection we're under that we're not even aware of if you go back to Deuteronomy 8 it says beware lest you say in your heart my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth 
Again, this all comes from a lack of appreciation from Jehovah, which comes from a lack of remembering all that he's done for you. It says, you shall remember Jehovah your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. To remember is a powerful thing. And in the New Testament, we see Yeshua giving us a way to remember all that he has done for us. Luke 22. He took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they'd eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It is important to remember. <clears throat> sure, the word made flesh, the bread of life, asks us not to forget what has been given to redeem us. Now we're going to take a closer look at the Last Supper. There's a great deal going on that at first glance we may easily miss. Especially if we rely on the painting below or others like it to inform us as to how the scene played out and what dynamics were at play. This is obviously a very Greco-Roman, modern, Western way of imagining how the scene might have looked. So this is just a guest date. I'll put a date in just to make like a point that this really happened. It was a real time. It really did occur. But I do believe it was a Tuesday. It's Tuesday, April the 27th, 28 AD. It's the day before the Passover and preparations need to be made. Jerusalem is teeming with pilgrims who have come to celebrate the feast. Luke 22, 7 to 13. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said to him, Where wilt that we go? That, where, where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters in. Now, for that day and age, that would have been unusual in itself for a man to be carrying a pitcher of water. So he would have stood out. Follow the man into the house. <clears throat> and you shall say to the good man of the house, the master says unto you, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there, make, uh, furnished there, make ready. And they went up and they found it just as he said to them and they made ready the Passover. Now, imagine the two of them and what they talked about. <laughs> Maybe they grumbled about being sent and being asked to set everything up. Like, oh, get asked again. Us having to go. But maybe they felt special to have been asked. It's us. We are the special ones. This special task has been given to us. How important we are. They've been picked up of the 12 before, haven't they? In Mark 9, it says, And after six days, Yeshua took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Okay, not known as the transfiguration. And those there, well, we've got Peter, James, and John, but it's Peter and John again. And I imagine that such an experience made them feel pretty special. Like to have been of the few that witnessed this. So then, I imagine when they were picked to go and make preparations, there's a chance that they also would have felt special. Now, it will be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship in the culture in the first century. Mealtimes were far more than occasions for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcomed at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. Now, the story of King David and Mephibosheth emphasizes the importance of being invited to someone's table. Also, it offers us a great picture of how Yehovah mercifully, mercifully deals with us. And to Samuel 9, David asks, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Is there no one still left to whom I can show God's kindness? This, of course, is um, Saul who would, you know, made every attempt to try and get rid of him. 
Ziba, the servant of Saul's household, is brought before David and asked who was left of Saul's family. And he replies, there is someone by the name of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, the grandson of David's enemy, Saul. And Mephibosheth is lame. And earlier in the book, we read that this was as a result of an accident as a child. 2 Samuel 4.4, 4. he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan's death um, came from Jezreel. His nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fled and became crippled. His name was Mephibosheth. So this was all on account of this situation um, between David and Saul. He gets crippled. Ziba tells David that Mephibosheth is living in Lodabar, which literally means place of no pasture. Um, that's far beyond the river Jordan. Mephibosheth was almost certainly trying to keep below the radar of the king, the man whom his grandfather tried to kill. David has Mephibosheth brought before him and then begins one of the most wonderful exchanges of the Old Testament. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied, in 2 Samuel 9, 7. David said to him, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. There's the importance of eating at the table. And he paid homage and he said, what is your servant that you should regard uh, show that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? The king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to his house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him, and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth your master's grandson shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. That's pretty remarkable. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. And it just keeps making this point. He ate at the king's table. It's a big deal. Mephibosheth first entered the courts of King David with fear and trepidation, and rightly so. Not only was he standing before God's anointed one, it had always been the perennial practice of kings to kill all the family members of the former king in order to prevent any future claims on the throne. And of course, as we saw, I mentioned, Saul was trying to kill David. However, what Mephibosheth finds is not wrath, but compassion. David does the unthinkable. For the love of Jonathan, he demonstrates God's kindness and blesses the grandson of his enemy, giving him back the land owned by his grandfather. Not only this, but he ignores the shame of Mephibosheth's disability, which is repeatedly emphasized by the text, and he invites him to always eat at the king's table. I think it's an amazing picture of God's great mercy towards us. When we come before the king, we should not expect anything but wrath due to the sins of our forefathers, and we should expect to be shunned because of the condition that we're in. David calls Mephibosheth from the place of no pasture through the Jordan River into the king's courts. And likewise, the king of heaven calls us to himself from a spiritual wasteland through the waters of baptism into his presence where we find not wrath, but mercy and kindness. Just as Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons and lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. So our Messiah, which is amazing, isn't it really? Wants for us to be with him. The last supper just before he offered himself up to be crucified, he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be there where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 2, 4, 5. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Um, <clears throat> indeed, we are blessed. So let's get back to Peter and John at the Last Supper. Now, as we come to this, bear in mind that these are the two people setting everything up. And table fellowship is a big deal. And there's things involved here um, that would have uh, been pertinent to the two of them. Just let it sink in that being welcomed at a table for the purpose of eating food with another person was a ceremony ritually symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. And around the time of the Last Supper, the table uh, that was used was called the Triclinium. This open-ended three-sided table surrounded by couches was a traditional setting for table fellowship throughout the Greek and Roman world in the first century. Seating at a triclinium was according to a traditional plan. The places of greater honor were to the left and those of lesser honor uh, to the right. It's these places of greater honor that Yeshua counseled against selecting at a feast lest someone more distinguished than you may have been invited, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. So there's a peck in order to where you would be sat, which is what he was referring to in Luke 14. Everyone in Yeshua's day knew about the order of seating arrangements, including the disciples. In a culture where table fellowship was such a big deal, seating arrangements were also a big deal. While setting up, I bet that Peter and John would have had some ideas about the seating. So it's Peter and John, and there's probably this, well, we're setting everything up. We're definitely going to be in the good spots. So you're not sitting, you're lying down, and you would always recline on your left elbow. And so you would eat with your right hand, even if you were left-handed. To eat at such a table, you'd have to learn to eat with your right hand and recline on your left elbow. So for a thief to have his right hand cut off as punishment would therefore then be a social stigma for you couldn't eat at a banquet. It's easy to see why the healing of the man with the withered right hand at the Capernaum synagogue would be a special joy. Now he could attend a banquet. Luke 6 says, On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue he was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was withered. Stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was restored. Point being made of which hand it was there, I think. It's interesting. So who sat where? Yeshua as the host would have sat second in from the left. On either side of the host are the main guest seats. And there's two main guest seats. And I'm just thinking of Peter and John setting everything up. I'm thinking, right, we know exactly how things pan out. I imagine they had ideas as to where they might be seated. Now the right side of the host or first seat would be for the right-hand man or assistant. Any host is a right-hand assistant or right-hand man. This comes from a military motif where a general in battlefield would nine out of ten times have their sword in their right hand. With their shield on their left, like that, right? They couldn't defend their right side. So they'd have a right-hand man with a shield to protect that undefended area. And that would be for the most trusted person. So Yeshua as the host has on his right-hand side, in the most trusted position, the right-hand man. And in John 13 we read, When Yeshua had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. The disciples looked one another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Yeshua's bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Yeshua's breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? And he answered him and he said, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sof, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So the one leaning on Yeshua was John. He was therefore the right-hand man. Now the third seat on the left of the host is for the guest of honor. 
located to the left of the host. Any host has a right-hand assistant, and so too a guest of honour. The way the host shows the guest of honour is to dip bread into his bowl and put it in the mouth of the guest of honour, which is called offering the sop. If you asked anyone in Yeshua's day how one shows who the guest of honour is, he shares the bowl of the host. Scripture then gives us a picture of the seating arrangements. You've got the host, the right-hand man, and the guest of honour. The host is Yeshua. The right-hand man, the one leaning on Yeshua's bosom, is John. And the one he offers the sop to is Judas. So these are in the important positions. If Yeshua has John leaning on his chest, Judas was already arranged to exchange information for money as Yeshua heavy on his heart in every sense of the word. He would have been leaning into him. Yeshua offered the dip to Jesus before he left, which is a sign of him loving him right to the end. He offered him that reconciliation bread right up to the last point, knowing what he was going to go through. So which disciple reclined in the lowest esteemed place at the table? That would be the position of the foot washer. The foot washer would be here, as you say, the place of the least honor, the furthest one around. The foot washer would be positioned at the end of the table. And when guests arrived, it was his job to greet them and wash their feet before they reclined at the table. And I think it was Peter. Sitting in the lowest spot doesn't sound much like Peter, though, does it? Because he was, you know, we'll see, you have to just find him in Mark's gospel, first out the boat, first to sink, first to confess, first to deny, first to guess when he doesn't know the right answer. So what suggests that it's Peter to me? He beckons to John to get him to ask Yeshua a question. So he's not close enough to ask he beckons to John, suggesting perhaps that he's facing opposite him and far away enough from where Yeshua was sat. The fact that no one's feet got washed at the beginning of the meal. Um, because I imagine that Peter probably thought he wasn't going to be the foot washer. <laughs> and I think suggested to me is this idea that when he found himself in that position, he was a bit disgruntled. And probably thought, I'm not doing that. Why do I think this? He's the only one who refused to let Yeshua wash his feet. He has a sword when they arrest Yeshua. The sword would be carried by the right-hand man, which suggests that in his own head, me and John get to set everything up. I keep getting the ask to God after the transfiguration. I'm pretty big deal around here suggest perhaps he thought he was going to be the right-hand man because it was the right-hand man to protect the host and he would be the one who would have a sword. Now, after the meal and the bread and the wine, just in case you think, well, I'm sure they weren't bothered about the dynamics of who was in the most important place and wasn't. Luke 22, and there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? So something about this situation has caused them to discuss, hang on a minute, who is the greatest? And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. You shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he that is chief as he that does serve. And time and time again in scripture we see that Yehovah resists the proud, but is with the humble. Miriam and Aaron oppose Moshe, and we read in Numbers 12, Now the man Moshe was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. This is the man that Yehovah is about to praise very highly, and it's made, this point is made, he is very meek, very humble, more than all the people on the earth. Suddenly Yehovah said to Moshe, to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you... You three to the tent of meeting, and the three of them came out, because you can't argue with Jehovah. Jehovah came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, 
I make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moshe. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of Yehovah. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? The anger of Yehovah was kindled against them and he departed. And of course, the cloud removed from over the tent. Behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned to Miriam and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moshe, Oh my Lord, do not punish us because we have do foolishly and have sinned. Let him not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moshe cries to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her, please. And of course, they sought to wound, wound Moshe with their words and he sought healing. Moshe, who is what? He is the most humble man on the earth. And the Lord says, you know, me and him have this special relationship, the way I speak with him. And so after the meal and the bread and the wine, there was a strife among the disciples of which of them should be the greatest. Now, I don't know that it was Peter in that situation, so I'm not saying that's definitely what was going on, but it, it does point to, it, to me. And what they're taught here is that the servant is the greatest. <clears throat> this is what Yeshua says to them. After all this kerfuffle, and this is what happens. He rises from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Yeshua answered unto him and said, What I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Yeshua answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, and he was set down again, he said to them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. If this was indeed Peter's responsibility to have done this, and he shaked it, can you imagine how he felt when he was listening to these words? Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now we be in position at the bottom of the table. If it's Peter, he was offered an amazing opportunity to achieve greatness in the kingdom, of course. The, so the last shall be first and the first last. He passed up the chance. Why? He was really passionate about his love for Yeshua, but maybe pride, fear of what one would say and think. Or maybe he just had his own idea of what it meant to serve Yehovah, and he had his own agenda. Indeed, we see um, evidence of this. When Yeshua tells the disciples that he must die, Matthew 16, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So he's rebuking the Messiah, going, no, it's not how it's going to pan out. But he turned and he said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So, again, seeing things from a worldly point of view, rather than seeing things from Yehovah's point of view, which, <clears throat> of course, would be a problem when it came to how you might look before other people. <clears throat> Shiva said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. To follow him is to walk as he walked. Whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected hereby, know that we, are, we know that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought to himself walk even as he walked. Yeshua, we know, walked according to the word. We also know that he was humble. He came to serve. Philippians 2, 
Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Yeshua Hamashiach is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility. Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does Yehovah require of you, but to do justice is mishpat, to love kindness, chesed, as pointed out in his word, and to walk humbly with your God. Chesed is his kindness and his mercy. To walk humbly with Yehovah is to walk in his ways, to do justice as he defines it in his word, to demonstrate his kindness, to esteem others, and not to put yourself first, to see things as Yehovah sees them not as men see them so as we said to break bread together is significant to break bread with each other points through i love you i forgive you you are my friend how incredible that yeshua broke bread and passed it to judas even knowing what he was about to do how incredible that he washed the feet of all the disciples even the one that thought the task beneath him the one who would deny him three times all this knowing that he was just about to go, what he was about to go through at the hands of the executioners. As we read before, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his sheep is his dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Luke 22. He took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, you'll not drink of the fruit of vine <clears throat> until the kingdom of God shall come. He took the bread, he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Do not forget me. Remember me. Likewise also, the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. To remember is a powerful thing. And for people who want to do this, um, remembrance of the bread and the wine, I suggest reading 1 Corinthians 11. And it's something that we here haven't done for a very long time. Um which is the, the reason being, which is when you go to Christian churches, people, it's like, I don't know, every other week we do the bread and the wine. And it just becomes this routine thing that, I don't know, it, it just doesn't seem to have, it loses all its meaning to people. It's just a religious rigmarole. And we didn't want to become like that. We didn't ever want it to not be something that was like a real moment. And so we avoided doing it repeatedly um, to the point now where we haven't done it for such a long time. And I just wanted to bring it up today to um, point to people to, this isn't something that you have to wait till you're in a church to do either. This, you could do this amongst members of your own family, amongst brothers and sisters in the, in the Lord. And you can... Um, participate in this powerful thing that it is to remember. Yeshua said, remember this. Do this in remembrance of me. We should never forget what he's done for us. So <clears throat> I just make a suggestion to people that if maybe like ourselves, you've not done it for a while, then you should look um, to rectify that. Okay. Okay, part two. I was feeling really sleepy then. So, Exodus 1. The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. 
Now, as we've noted, the suggestion here perhaps is that the Israelites have lost their set of partners, abandoned their call and his shepherds. And they've done well, uh, you know, increased abundantly, waxed mighty. Yeah, the indications are that maybe they've forgotten Yehovah, and it never goes well when we do forget Yehovah. Hence all the warnings in Scripture and the call to remember. Yehovah blesses his people. <clears throat> Psalm 105, the Lord made his people very fruitful, made them stronger than their foes. Then steps in, but he turned their heart to hate his people. Of course, he is sovereign over all things. And we see it written down for us. There arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. A period of favor coming to an end, perhaps. And he said, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and mighty for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. They ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And as we saw it in Psalm 105, it's the Lord who's turned these people against his people. Many of the plans in the mind of a man, but is the purpose of Yehovah that will stand. I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours um, can be thwarted. I think it's remarkable. <clears throat> Another example of Yehovah's sovereignty. Then we read in Exodus 1, The king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua. I think it's also interesting that the Pharaoh's name is not mentioned, but these ladies are. And he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, and you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So the midwives were commanded to kill the male babies. But then we read, but the midwives feared God. And did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but save the men children alive. The king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered, uh, the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. It came to pass because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses, um, where they could employ households or families. And this was God's blessing on the midwives. He enabled them to have children of their own. Usually midwives held their occupation because they had no children of their own. And of course, in their culture, that was a real stigma. So this would have been an incredible blessing. Now, the civil government commanded something that was clearly against Yehovah's command. The midwives did the only right thing. They obeyed Yehovah rather than man. They acted on the same principle as did the persecuted apostles in Acts 4.19 when Peter asked the civil authorities whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God you judge. Generally, you were called to obey the government and honor civic rulers, Romans 13, 1 to 5. We're never called to put government in the place of Yehovah. Therefore, if the government tells us to do something against Yehovah's will, we are to obey Yehovah first. And it's worth noting what motivated the midwives to act as they did. The midwives feared God. So the fear of Yehovah comes from an understanding of who he is. And we see in scripture that the friendship of Yehovah is for those who fear him. Psalm twenty-five, fourteen: the friendship of Yehovah is for those who fear him. He makes known to them his covenant. And those who fear Yehovah delight in his commandments. We see that in Psalm 112. Blessed is the man who fears Yehovah, who greatly delights in his commandments. Interestingly, those who love Yehovah cherish his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So those who fear Yehovah are those who love him. Those who fear Yehovah and love him walk in his ways. Psalm 128 verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears Yehovah 
who walks in his ways. They delight in his commandments. Why? Because they are who Yehovah is. Loving Yehovah and fearing him come from the same place and understanding and appreciation of who he is. The connection between fearing Yehovah and walking in his ways is clear in Scripture. Another example, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fearing him, loving him, cherishing his commandments, all interrelated. Deuteronomy 5.29, fear me, keep all my commandments. Deuteronomy 12.12, fear Yehovah your God to walk in all his ways, to love him. So fearing him, loving him, walking in his ways, all uh, connected. It was by his obedience that Abraham demonstrated that he feared Yehovah. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, O Yehovah, that I might walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. His name, obviously, is character, to fear you. Teach me your way that I might walk according to your word, that I might fear you. So there's a cry of David asking Yehovah to help him to have fear of his name, to have a fear of Yehovah. And in his plea to Yehovah, we see that David recognizes that fearing Yehovah and knowing his ways are not independent of each other. Yet by and large, Christianity has no interest in Yehovah's ways and most Christians are not interested in walking in his truth, his word. We see that for the most part, believers are not, despite how they might describe themselves, God-fearing. I've covered this a few years ago. <clears throat> I think we might have made it into a short video, but I just think it's um, worth coming back to. Um, not despite, <clears throat> they call themselves God-fearing, but they have fear, but it is not the fear of Yehovah that is mentioned in the Scriptures Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yehovah and turn away from evil. Many people think they know better than Yehovah. His word says one thing, but they think, no, I've got a better way. They do not fear Yehovah. Psalm 25, 12. Who is the man who fears Yehovah? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. The one who fears Yehovah is the one who has Yehovah watching over him, instructing him. Proverbs 28, 14. Blessed is the one who fears Yehovah always. Conversely, whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. To be hard-hearted <clears throat> is to refuse to humble yourself before the Lord, to refuse to repent, um, and it is to be rebellious. Proverbs 8. The fear of Yehovah is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. When you fear Yehovah, you hate what he hates. You'll hate sin, for example. Again, this is because fearing God comes from an understanding and appreciation of who he is. Psalm 5, 4 to 6. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The foolish shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all workers of iniquity. You destroy those who speak lies. Yehovah abhors the thirsty and deceitful man. And when you fear God and you know him and you have an understanding of who he is, then these things will be appalling to you as well. The fear of Yehovah is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay. <clears throat> Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Um, <clears throat> there's probably not many fools who would say, I despise wisdom and instruction me, you know, I despise it. But um, <clears throat> it's by people's actions, by their response, for example, to the word that they identify themselves as fools, not necessarily by what they say. Proverbs 15.33, the fear of Yehovah is instruction in wisdom and humility comes before honor. Interesting, in light of what we read earlier with regards to the Last Supper. Psalm 111.10. The fear of Yehovah is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. So, all who practice it. The fear of Yehovah is something that is applied to how one lives one's life. To practice the fear of Yehovah is to act in a way that you have an understanding of who he is. 
We see the great benefits of fearing Yehovah written down for us in Scripture. Luke 1, 50. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Wow. Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of Yehovah leads to life. Life, mercy is great. Whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Psalm 25, 14. The friendship, we just read it before, is for those who fear him. Incredible things here. Mercy, life, friendship, not visited by harm. Oh, fear Yehovah, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Proverbs 22, 4. The reward of humility and the fear of Yehovah are riches, honor, and life. And I think it's interesting there, isn't it, that these two things... Um, are put together humility and the fear of Yehovah, of riches, honor, and life. <clears throat> Just um, going back to what we were mentioning earlier, and the, the teaching that Yeshua gave when he went and um, washed the feet of the disciples. Um, well, for us, it's not just the humility that we have um, one towards each other. It's also the humility that we have before Yehovah. Um, and of course, it would be connected to the fear of Yehovah because the fear of Yehovah comes from an understanding of who he is. And humility also comes from a place of understanding who he is. Most people don't understand who he is blessed is everyone who fears Yehovah who walks in his ways the connection here between being humble and fearing Yehovah walking in his ways and fearing Yehovah when you humble yourself before Yehovah of course you will walk in his ways and it's a place of great blessing you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands you shall be blessed and it shall be well with you your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears Yehovah. Oh, it went mad then. You who fear Yehovah, trust in Yehovah. He is their help and their shield. The angel of Yehovah encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, fear Yehovah, his saints, those who fear him. As we read before, have no lack. Psalm 31, 19. How great is your goodness which you've stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. Also, <clears throat> people who don't fear Yehovah, who don't humble themselves before him, they tend to not take refuge in him. They'll take refuge in other things like, I don't know, They'll seek shelter and comfort and things like wealth, popularity. I don't know. <clears throat> they don't look to Yehovah anyway. Psalm 140, uh, 145, 19. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and he will save them. And then Psalm 147, 11. Yehovah favors those who fear him. Those who wait for his loving kindness. So to fear him is to wait on his loving kindness, which again comes from an understanding of who he is. Psalm 33, 18 to 19. Behold, the eye of Yehovah is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, his chesed. Those who fear him, hope in his kindness, again, because fear in him comes from an understanding, appreciation of who he is, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? <laughs> Malachi 3. Then those who feared Jehovah spoke with one another. And Jehovah paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared Jehovah and esteemed his name. So fearing him and esteeming his name go hand in hand. To fear Yehovah is to esteem his name and his character. Again, this is because fearing Yehovah comes from an understanding and appreciation of who he is. They shall be mine, says Yehovah, as I open the day when I make up my treasured possession. 
And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Fear, my word study. <clears throat> the first root we'll examine is pahad. We see in Job 4.14, fear, pahad the noun came upon me and trembling and caused all my bones to shake. And it's the same word but in the verb form. In this verse, the word fear is the noun, meaning shaking. While the word shake is the verb, pahad meaning to shake. The second Hebrew root is yara. In the following verse, we'll see that this verb means fear in the sense of what we would consider fear. Genesis 3.10, I heard your voice in the garden and I feared because I was naked and hid myself. That's yara there. The next verse, we see the same Hebrew word in a more positive context. You will revere Yehovah your Elohim and you will serve him and in his name you will swear. Same word though. Many would conclude from these two passages that this Hebrew word has two different meanings. Fear, as in, uh, and reverence, as in, oh. This assumption is caused by an incorrect understanding of the Hebrew vocabulary. Each Hebrew word has only really one meaning, but many different applications. And as JP has pointed out many times, the concept of some of these Hebrew words is difficult to put into English words. The literal concrete meaning of Yara is a flowing of the gut, which can be applied to fear or reverence. Have you ever been so scared or been in the presence of something so amazing that you could feel it in your gut? This feeling is the meaning of this word. Proverbs 9.10 The fear, the yira of Yehovah is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of uh, the holy is understanding. The word fear in this verse is the noun yira derived from the verb yira. The Hebrew for fear of Yehovah as found in the verse above is written with two nouns, yirat, Yehovah. Yirat is a feminine noun ending with the letter tav. When yirat is used in the construct state, the he from the yirat is converted to a tav, yirat. In this case, yeah, as it says, yirat. The construct state, what is that? When a noun precedes another noun, two nouns together. The first noun is in the construct state, meaning it is connected to the second noun. Two words forming one concept. An example of a construct noun can be found in the phrase, the kingdom of God. Notice the first noun, kingdom, belongs to the second noun, God. Interesting, because the word for fear, Yira, when it is the fear of Yehovah, now contains a tav, which is interesting when you consider the shape. It also suggests mark, sign, covenant. Here's a complete list of construct phrases from the book of Genesis where the second word in the construct state is in the construct is Yehovah. The word of Yehovah, the voice of Yehovah, the face of Yehovah, the name of Yehovah, the eyes of Yehovah, the garden of Yehovah, the angel of Yehovah, the way of Yehovah, the mount of Yehovah. You'll notice in every instance the first word in the construct, word, voice, etc., belongs to the second word of the construct, Yehovah. So why would we think fear in the construct? Phrase, phrase, fear of Yehovah is our fear and not Yehovah's. We know Yehovah cannot fear, as, but as pointed out previously, the Hebrew verb yarat literally means to flow out of the gut. Now the question becomes, what flows out of the gut of Yehovah? Look at two other constructs which might shed some light on what the fear of Yehovah might be. Psalm 1 2. His delight is in the law of Yehovah, and in his law does he meditate day and night. The Hebrew for the law of Yehovah is Torah Yehovah. The word Torah, Torah is the construct form of the feminine noun Torah, means teachings. It is derived from the verb Yerat, meaning to throw in the sense of flowing, and is closely related to the verb Yerat, which we are currently examining. Not only are they related in the sense, uh, both are from the same parent root, yah, but they are also related by definition. The second construct is found in Judges 3.10. And the spirit of Yehovah came upon him. The construct, ruah, Yehovah, we find the word ruah meaning wind, another type of flow where the spirit is the essence of the character. What flows out of the gut of Yehovah, his teachings and his character. 
Now, I can't say for certain that yara, fear, literally means flowing from the gut, but I know the root of the word has to do with flowing. And from a different source, we can see what was written. The root meaning of the word yara is to flow and is related to words meaning rain or stream as a flowing of water. In Hebrew, though, it can be what is felt when in the presence of an awesome sight or person of great authority. These feelings flow out of the person in such actions as shaking when in reverence or bowing down in awe of one in authority. And the reason I share this is to emphasize the fact that the fear of Yehovah is not something you can come to understand independent of Yehovah. Yirat Yehovah, it is a fear connected to Yehovah. Like the kingdom of God, it's not, they're not separate. It is something that comes from a reckoning of who he is, his character, as identified in his word, as best understood when one begins to walk in his truth. There are many who choose not to walk in his ways who will say that they fear him. There's a Christian world full of people who call themselves God-fearing people. But it's not the fear of Yehovah <clears throat> that we've been reading about in Scripture. This is not a fear that is totally dependent upon understanding and appreciating who Yehovah is, a fear that flows from him. This is a fear that flows from themselves. And it's more about the appreciation of the self and wanting the best for themselves. As we've seen, the fear of Yehovah is totally connected to loving Yehovah. The fear that many espouse is more to do with love of the self which is why we can have a form of Christianity that has so little to do with walking in Yehovah's commandments and knowing him by walking in his word, but has everything to do with escaping the judgment that is to come. Most Christians don't fear Yehovah, they fear the consequences of living a sinful life, but it is a life they do not want to repent of because they do not love Yehovah, which is why you've got this bizarre religion of Christianity, which allows people to say they fear the Lord without walking in his ways, which is how you love him, saying that they love him without actually loving him. And yet somehow in this refuge of lies that they've put together allows them to escape um, the judgment that is to come and thereby feel, oh, oh, everything's going to be okay. <clears throat> Yelvah, though we see, is not interested in those who might go after him only for their own gain. John 12, quoting from Isaiah, He's blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts, and turn, repent, and I would heal them. Yehovah is the friend of those who fear him, those who have an appreciation of who he is that is demonstrated perfectly by their love for him. Um, and his ways. He's not interested in people who are just self-seeking, self-serving, making a pretense just to escape um, what they see might be written of in Scripture, the judgment that is to come. Matthew 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which you just read. You will was just seen, you will indeed hear but never understand and you will indeed see but never perceive. She speaks of so many people who love to come and hear the word, but they don't actually do it. Um, it just all just sounds good to them and they like going through the routine. This people's heart has grown dull, hard, calloused, unfeeling is what the word in the Greek actually refers to and their ears they can barely hear and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. You know, Yehovah is not interested in these people. And then he says to his disciples, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Now to see speaks of understanding, to hear speaks of hearkening, shimar and obeying. And these speak of loving Yehovah and of fearing him. So, again, those who fear him are the ones who are blessed. The fear of Yehovah is a precious thing, and it is something we come to understand when we have a sense of who he is. Proverbs 2, 1 to 5, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments within you, 
making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver, search for it as for hidden treasures. Okay, this is all about an appreciation of the word. Um, treasuring up his commandments, a delight in his word. Then you will understand the fear of Jehovah and find the knowledge of God. With the gift of the fear of the Lord, one is made aware of the glory and majesty of God as well. This gift is described by Aquinas as a fear of separating oneself from God. He describes the gift as a filial fear, like a child's fear of offending his father, rather than a servile fear that is a fear of punishment. The very fact that he is merciful gives us cause to fear him even. Psalm 130, verse 4. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. There is a, a hope in his kindness that causes us to not want to offend him. Again, this is derived from a place of love. We still must recognize that we're to fear Jehovah, though, in the sense of being aware of his great might. Psalm 211. Serve Jehovah with fear and rejoice with trembling. In the book of Hebrews, we're given a glimpse of how terrifying Yehovah's presence can be. And in the same passage, we're given the picture of him as our loving father, the one who disciplines. Now, I was afraid of my dad. Um, and I knew he was much more powerful than me. That's my dad up there. But <laughs> and, uh, I didn't want to cross him or earn his disfavor. That said, I felt like I could approach him. I didn't cower away into the corner every time he entered the room. I trusted him to look after me. I knew he loved me even when he disciplined me deep down. I knew that. I might have like you know, said nonsense at the time. Like kids sometimes do. But. Hebrews 12. If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are a legitimate son. The children are not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? And later on it says, You have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, speaking of what happened at Sinai. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moshe said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks of a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. The things is founded on his word. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. This word for reverence, modesty, bashfulness, reverence, regard for others, respect. And then this word for awe, reverence towards God, godly fear, fear, anxiety, dread. So in this passage, we're called to consider how mighty Yehovah is. We read that Moshe trembled with fear, that Yehovah's voice shook the earth. But the time is coming when the heavens will also be shaken. And there's a call to reverence here, a call for a recognition of just who Yehovah is. But in this passage, we're also called to recognize Yehovah as our father, a father who out of love will discipline his children. Psalm 103, 13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so Yehovah shows compassion to those who fear him. <clears throat> so
So just take it on board that the fear of Yehovah, it's not, um, <clears throat> you can't have the fear of Yehovah without an understanding of who he is. Um, and the fear of Yehovah that most people espouse, it doesn't come from him, it doesn't flow from him. It flows from themselves and a sense of self-preservation, a, a fear of missing out or whatever it might be. But those who truly fear Yehovah are blessed. And these are the people who love him. These are the people who love his word and love his commandments. So the midwives were commanded to kill the male babies. <clears throat> but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. We read, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. And they went out a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, um, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Three is kind of a real significant number when you think of uh, messianic pictures. Particularly here, as we see a picture of resurrection, that is life from death. He's had an order of death placed on him, but as we'll see, he survives. When she could no longer hide him, <clears throat> she took him. She took for him an ark, same way as Noah's ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime, with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it among the reeds by the river's brink. So he's a child condemned to death by the most powerful forces of this world. Well, of course, he's not going to die. He's a child who would nevertheless be raised up to redeem his people from bondage and establish a new nation. His sister stood afar off to see what would be done with him. <clears throat> just, um, the bit where it says she could no longer hide him. Can you imagine the stress every time he was crying and stuff? Well, <clears throat> the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she'd opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. She had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister uh, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away um, and nurse it for me, and I will give it. The, thy wages and the woman took the child and nursed it big moments of delight Moshe uh, Moshe's mother ends up being paid to rear Moshe before she takes him back to the Pharaoh's daughter that was the result wasn't it <laughs> now let's jump ahead we're going to see the Passover the Israelites leave in Egypt the Egyptians pursued after them to the point where we read, Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. The holy Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid. The children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They complained bitterly at the water. In Exodus 14, Moshe said to the people, Fear not, stand firm in the word is Yatzav, and see the salvation of Jehovah, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Jehovah will fight for you. If only to be silent. The waters part, as we know, the Israelites pass through safely. The Egyptians pursue them, but it doesn't go well for them. And after the way is made for Israel to pass to safety through the sea, they watch their enemies being destroyed. Then there is rejoicing. The people sing the song of Moshe. In Exodus 15, Yehovah will reign forever and ever. When the horses of the Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, Jehovah brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aharon, took a tambourine in her hand, the one who's just witnessed this event with the Pharaoh's daughter, grabbing hold of Moshe. All the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to Jehovah, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider that he has thrown into the sea. And all that stuff that happens in Parsha Beshalach is like a replay of what we see here. Moshe is placed in the river Nile in the reeds. Miriam watched 
Um, and she stood from afar, and this is the same word used there, which is Yatsav. She had no idea what would happen. As when she saw Pharaoh's daughter approach, she must have feared the worst, just as the people on the shores of the Sea of Reeds must have feared when they saw the Egyptian armies approaching. So we've got the river of Reeds, Moshe, Pharaoh's daughter. And we later see the Sea of Reeds, the Israelites, Pharaoh and his army. And when Pharaoh and his army approach, he says, Fear ye not, stand and watch, yes, have. It's like a replay. Just do what Miriam did then, <clears throat> is effectively what he's saying. Stand and watch, Yatsav. And Yatsav is an important word. If you want to be able to rejoice like Miriam, then fear you not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, Yatsav. That is, don't fear men. And this is something that we'll have a look at in a minute. But to Yatsav, if people want to know what that's all about, uh, I'll point you to um, previous years when I've done the Torah portion, um, Beshalak, and it speaks of putting on the armor of Yehovah, which speaks of walking in his word. Exodus 2 continues, and it says, The child grew, and she brought him in unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called his name Moshe, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And in Hebrew, the name means plucked from water. It's derived from the Hebrew verb root Masha. And it is a relative of the Hebrew verb root yasha, meaning to rescue or to save, which forms the verb root for the name Yeshua. So Moshe picked from the water or plucked from the water, a fitting name for the man raised up by Yehovah to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. Israel, a nation, as it were, plucked from the water. Acts 7.22 says, And Moshe was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So he was a big deal. So, um, I think we often overlook it, don't we, um, when we think of his, Moshe's life. But, I mean, he grew up in the, the courts of Pharaoh, as we see it. He was very learned, mighty in words and deeds. But in Hebrews 11, we read something brilliant. By faith, Moshe, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This place where he would have had great opulence and um, respect. Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Amazing. He could have easily become very well. He had access to all that the world had to offer. Moshe, synonymous Torah, the word and the truth. But well, he chose to be set apart. He went after Yehovah. He feared Yehovah. Proverbs fifteen sixteen says, Better is a little with the fear of Yehovah than great treasure and trouble with it. And people I've heard in the past when talking about the fear of Yehovah, I said, but we don't fear God anymore. And they'll say things like, perfect love casts out fear. In fact, one fellow said, we don't fear God anymore because we call him Father now. Perfect love casts out fear. And uh, we'll go to 1 John 4. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Um, who does Yehovah give his spirit to? Acts 5.32. Um, we are witness of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. Those that obey him is the answer then. For those who have the Spirit, those that obey him, those are the ones who abide in him. And in verse 16, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So this is all predicated on abide in him, which is, you know, for those who have the Spirit, who are those who obey. And by this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. So this work is established in us when Jehovah's Spirit dwells within us. So the context for the next statement we see there um, has just been established, and it's all talking about having confidence for the day of judgment. And that's when we read the phrase, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected 
in love. This is not saying that we no longer have the fear of Jehovah, the fear that is synonymous with loving him, reverencing, respecting his might and his power and authority. This passage is simply saying that if his love is perfected in us, then we may have confidence on the day of judgment. How is this love perfected in us? This work is established in us when Jehovah's spirit dwells in us and his spirit is given to them who obey. Those who obey or those who know the fear of Jehovah. We lose the sense of fear as in the fear of punishment, Phobos, but we do not lose the sense of fear as in the staring we have of awe and wonder or the love that accompanies it. Yeshua was without sin. He was perfect in love, but he feared Jehovah. Isaiah 11, 2, the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Jehovah. He came as Jehovah in the flesh and was our perfect example in every way. He wasn't terrified of who he was, was he? That's because the fear of Jehovah is something that is applied to how we live our lives. It comes from an understanding and appreciation of all that Jehovah is. And it is demonstrated in love, which itself is demonstrated by cherishing the commandments. And people say, we walk according to the spirit now. And Paul says we haven't been given a spirit of fear. Okay, and that's reference in 2 Timothy 1. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And what we actually have here is Paul calling Timothy to be bold in doing that which he's been called to do. To be bold in declaring the gospel. He's telling Timothy that Yelva's spirit does not cause us to fear man. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the sake of the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, apostle and teacher which is why i suffer as i do but i'm not ashamed for i know whom i have believed and i'm convinced he's able to guard until that day that which has been entrusted to me so <clears throat> in other words paul is saying look i've been called to speak jehovah's truth it hasn't been easy but i'm not ashamed of my call or the one who called me by jehovah's spirit i have power and love and self-control and courage to declare the gospel and Paul is encouraging Timothy. Timothy, a man who has faith there by obedience, a man who clearly understands the fear of Jehovah. For those who walk, who fear rather Jehovah and walk in his ways, they need not fear man, be overwhelmed by circumstance, or even consider themselves alone, vulnerable, or insignificant. As we shall see, even humble shepherds who fear Jehovah can challenge kings who don't. I'm going to pass three. Right, Moshe turns 40. Exodus 2 continues. came to pass in those days when Moshe was grown that he went out unto his brethren and he looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. But Moshe, he grew up in Pharaoh's house as the son of Pharaoh's daughter and the house the Egyptians were his brethren. But now instead... His actions will be dictated by a deep identification with his Israelite brethren. It's interesting that Moshe actually noticed the suffering of his brethren and actually sought to alleviate it by risking all and stepping in with regards to the plight of one slave and his position. You also read uh, in the following verses of two more incidents when Moshe will step in. We have the two Hebrews struggling with each other and the daughters at the well that are driven away. He does seem to have empathy and compassion and to want to alleviate suffering. And then we read, though, he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So Moshe is now a murderer. This gives us plenty to consider when we think about Jehovah's grace. 
Of course, this is Moshe, the man Yehovah will choose to lead his people out of Egypt. And this is Moshe that, as we read earlier, is a prophet of Yehovah like no other. For all of those <clears throat> who think themselves unworthy of Yehovah's mercy. Um, and this is something I interjected into the Torah portion, um, kind of at the last minute. It's based on a conversation that I had with JP. JP made me aware that in response to the Greats video, someone said that they were undeserving of Yehovah's grace, that they had perceived it to be the unmerited favor idea of what grace is. But obviously Yehovah thinks of us as deserving of it because he gives it to the elect. It is unearned, but that's different. So these were my thoughts. I don't see it as being deserving or not, more that he sees the potential in us to have a relationship with him. Those who repent, i.e. those who repent and believe, or those who are drawn to him, these are the people that Yehovah is drawn to have a relationship with, and grace makes the relationship possible. Scripture says that Yehovah is merciful, of course, to the merciful. <clears throat> so then we might ask, do the merciful then earn or deserve his mercy? As I see it, the people who exhibit his traits are those that Yehovah sees potential for relationship. I don't think he looks at us and thinks, you've earned mercy. I think he looks and sees people who he can have a relationship with. I think by definition, mercy is a generosity that is given that is beyond what can be expected. You deserve this, but I'm going to let you off. Saying Yehovah's mercy is earned is like saying that in certain instances, Yehovah has no choice. But to me, the whole concept of mercy falls to pieces if there is no choice. Ephesians 2.8 says this, By grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So grace through faith, and that is of course talking about faith that isn't dead. And faith that isn't dead leads to what? It leads to obedience. Faith that is real is accounted to us as righteousness, and it's not, so therefore it is not by works. So this isn't unmerited favor. It is Yehovah making it possible for those who demonstrate that they love him by adopting his traits, drawing near to him with repentance, by their obedience, to be in a relationship with him. I can't envisage standing before Yehovah and thinking, being in his kingdom is all possible because of his grace, but little pat on the back for me because after all, I deserved it. I don't think it's a case of me asking whether I deserved or it's undeserved. I don't think deserved comes into it from where I am standing. It's not for me to ask if I, or think I deserve this or I don't. I think we always end up <clears throat> with an unsatisfying answers when we ask the wrong questions. And I think if asking if Yehovah's grace is deserved or not is a case of asking the wrong question. But he certainly does choose us. And a good question is based on what? And you might say he must think of those whom he chooses as deserving of it. I think that Yehovah in his generosity reaches out to those he is drawn to have a relationship and makes a way. Those he's drawn to have a relationship with those who draw near to him in repentance, who demonstrate they love him by keeping his commandments and doing them. If we got what we deserved, it'd all be done for. His grace takes us beyond what we deserve or have earned. The wages of sin is death, of course. His mercy and grace are for those who love him as evidenced by their actions. I can see that if you're saying loving him is the way by which you earn or deserve his grace, then you may be sort of right, not about earn, but deserved. It's a bit crass to me, though, and completely the wrong way of looking at it. I'm not comfortable personally saying I have Yehovah's grace because I deserve it, even when deserve is seen as something different from earned. I deserve it seems a long way from giving thanks for it, which is the correct response to Yehovah's grace, kindness and mercy towards us. JP asked me, would you be comfortable saying that you are worthy to walk in with him in white or that you hope to be? And I said, I would go as far as to say that scripture suggests that it is those whose repentance is true that Yehovah sees to be deserving of his grace. So it's just a completely different way of looking at it. Coming at it from our point of view, i.e. am I deserving or undeserving or I am worthy, seems the wrong way to view it to me. I think coming at it from Yehovah's point of view would be the best way to look at it. In other words, you can say Yehovah sees those who love him as being worthy 
of his grace. Those who love him, as is evidenced by their faith and by the fact that they have a faith that is alive, causes them to walk in obedience. Yehovah sees those who truly repent and draw near to him as deserving of his grace and mercy then. Um, is, I think, a much better way of looking at things than to sit there um, and either think, I deserve his grace and mercy, or I am undeserving of his grace and mercy. Far better just to sit and just understand and appreciate that. Yehovah, in his great mercy, offers his mercy and grace um, to those people who truly repent and draw near to him. These people who love him, he in his great kindness sees these people as deserving of um, his grace and mercy. Now Mark 4.12 is interesting. It uh, shows that there are those that Jehovah doesn't want drawing near to him, that he doesn't want relationship, as we alluded to earlier when we looked at the scripture in Isaiah. But it also shows that it is his nature to be predisposed to forgiveness, much like his description of himself to Moshe suggests in Exodus 34, 6-7, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundance in kindness and truth. This is Yehovah describing himself. Um, Mark 4, 12, actually, like we read earlier, uh, they may indeed see but not perceive, may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. There are those people that Yehovah... <clears throat> doesn't want to um, enter into relationship with. Um, and I just think it's incredible. But he's so predisposed to be generous in this way. Um, I just think it's incredible. For those people who genuinely love him, as we say, it's so obvious who loves him because they're the people who keep his commandments and they're not bad into him. They love the commandments. They love the word. These people... Because he's so predisposed to be so kind and gracious and abundant in kindness, he actually sees as deserving of his amazing love, his amazing grace and forgiveness and mercy. JP said, Yehovah only wants those whom he foreknew as elect, the vessels who were made for honor. And we'll see a verse later that speaks of this. Matthew 10, 37 to 38 says, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And um, Taking up your cross speaks of dying to self, which speaks of true repentance. And when it says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, this is talking about love in terms of choice. Um, so he's saying, if you will put them before me, then you are not worthy of me. So the people <clears throat> that are worthy of him are the people who put him first um, and the people who are prepared to die to self to be um, people who have truly repented. So that's who he sees as being worthy of him. Ephesians 4, 1 to 7. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And think about what we've been called to. We've been called to spread the good news, to be ambassadors for the creator of all things. Walk with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to us, each one as according to the measure of Christ's gift. And this is <clears throat> kind of part of what is amazing about um, our walk with the Lord. It is the fact that we can actually have this hope. This hope that we will be with him, that we are his, and that we will, that we are saved, shall we just put it like that. But what is this hope based upon? It's based upon a knowledge of who he is, and an understanding of his nature, an understanding, and also uh, an appreciation of who he is. And it brings us again back to 
those who fear the Lord, um, who of course are also those who love the Lord. And these are the people who can have a hope in the grace that is given um, as a gift. And these are the people who <clears throat> Jehovah wants to have relationship with. Of course, we read in Philippians again, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. This incredible news that Jehovah is kind and compassionate and for some reason deems those who come towards him who draw near to him as worthy of his grace and of his love and his kindness. This is the great news and we should live in a way that is worthy of that incredible message. 1 Thessalonians 2. You know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Um, what a hope it is <laughs> to, to walk um, bearing such amazing good news to um, be given such mercy and kindness bestowed upon you by the God of all creation who calls you into his kingdom and to his glory. We read earlier, didn't we, about Yeshua speaking to his disciples and he speaks to the Father. He says, I want them to be where I am so that they can see my glory. And um, there, is, there is no part of me that will ever stand there when I see the Lord in his glory and go, I deserve this. But there is a part of me that will say, Somehow, the Lord is so kind and so merciful and so generous that just because I came towards him in my ragged state and asked that he would be my God and he humbled myself before him, for this, somehow he saw me as deserving of his grace and his mercy and invites me to come into his kingdom and his glory. It is incredible. <clears throat> And of course, it is an unmerited favor. Like, oh, just crack on and do whatever you want. Because this is for those who truly come before him and humble themselves before him. So the ones who are, those that fear him, those that love him. Colossians 1, 9 to 15. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Okay. Yeah, yeah. JP just said it might be worth mentioning that it's not a case of you being deserving of it, but it's you copying his attributes that would in some way make you deserving of it. And you think what true repentance is, it is dying to self so that Christ might live in you. So as to make uh, in a manner worthy, so as to walk rather in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And every good work we see throughout scripture um, <clears throat> is talking of walking in his word. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. This is another thing. When you truly have hope in him, there should be joy. Giving thanks to the Father, which is another thing. Giving thanks to the Father. As I mentioned earlier, the people who give thanks are the people who actually take the time to sit and remember what has been done for them. It was qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light so <clears throat> thank you lord for qualifying us to share in the inheritance of the saints he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins we've been redeemed that we might have life and we know the mercy of jehovah ephesians 1 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach who has blessed us in Messiah with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Yeshua HaMashiach according to the purpose of his will. In him we have redemption through his blood 
the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom Jehovah counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So, <clears throat> talking about those <clears throat> he chose before the foundation of the world. He's outside of time, isn't he? I just think um, if you truly appreciate um, what this is actually saying, um, it's it's difficult to um, to respond to it in any other way. If you truly hope in the Lord, um, than to just have absolute joy and to be grateful, um, which is why I see the benefit that it mentions in Scripture of this call to remembrance um, as being so important and often overlooked by people. And Yeshua explains who it is that truly blessed here. Of course, we know who it is who were blessed. It's those who, are, who belong to the Lord, those who do know his grace and his mercy. But he says here in Luke 11, he said these things. A woman in the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. And he said, rather, blessed, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Those who hear the word of God and cherish it. Which brings us back again to... Who are the people who hear the word and keep it, um, who cherish it? They're the people that love him. They're the people that fear him, who have a knowledge and appreciation of who he is. Blessed are those who love Jehovah, as is demonstrated by the cherishing of his word. It is these who turn to him to walk in his ways, who truly repent. All those who come to Jehovah in true repentance are ransomed and forgiven of their sins. Even before the earth was made, Yehovah, who was outside of time, knew who it would be that would love him, the elect. Icah 7, 8. Who is a God like you, pardon iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He delights in kindness. He delights in, in the Hebrew, chesed. So, I hope that in some way it was helpful for anybody um, who might um, be struggling with the idea of deserving or undeserving of Jehovah's grace. Now, back to the Parsha. We've just seen Moshe is now a murderer, bit of a big deal. Moshe was of the tribe of Levi, of course. Levi was probably regarded as the black sheep tribe of the least honorable of all. The legacy Levi left behind for his descendants was that of a cruel, hot-tempered avenger of blood. The previous slide there was um, a picture of what happened at Shechem, of course. It seems that Moshe possesses the same basic character flaws as his ancestor. Hot-headed response, let's go in, bring me sword with me. Verse 13, and when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said to him that did the wrong, Where did you, wherefore did you smite thou fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou kill the Egyptian? Okay, so now he knows he's been spotted. Moshe feared and said, Surely this thing is known. So the one being addressed by Moshe is not happy. He accuses Moshe of being a judge. People don't always like being judged by Moshe. <laughs> Moshe feared because he said, Surely this matter is known. What is it that is now out in the open? Is it the mere fact he killed an Egyptian? Or is it Moshe's change in attitude that he no longer identifies himself as an Egyptian, but is joined in heart and soul with the Israelites? This would make him a rebel of the kingdom. Pharaoh would fear that he could end up leading a rebellion against him. There's a price to pay when you divulge your Hebrew identity, when you cross over, which I believe is the definition of Hebrew, when you see yourself as an Israelite. And um, of course, there'll be conflict of interest as there is perceived to be here. So when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moshe. Pharaoh did indeed think, wow, this is a big deal. 
But Moshe fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. He's been turned on by his Israelite brethren and is now exiled from his Egyptian brethren. It's a fitting picture of where we often find ourselves. The world can't stand us, and neither can those who claim Yehovah's name and yet refuse to be challenged by Moshe, i.e. by the Torah. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moshe stood up and helped them and watered their flock. That sounds familiar. We saw Moshe flees from Pharaoh as Yaakov flees from his brother. Moshe to the rescue waters the flock, just as it was Yaakov to the rescue uh, waters the flock. Genesis 29. And when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Eating of bread, a big deal again. Moshe was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moshe Zipporah, his daughter. Again, this all sounds very familiar. Moshe meets Yitro, just like Yaakov meets Levan. Yitro gives Moshe his daughter as a wife, just as Levan promises Rachel to Yaakov for a wife. So Moshe becomes a shepherd, as did Yaakov. And in both cases, what we have is sin, and we have exile. Then they become shepherds, which as we've seen is a representation of becoming righteous. Maybe a case of repentance for the two. Then they return. Everything is cyclical. It's always the same story. It's always written down for our instruction. We're a people in exile, and if we want to return, then there must be true repentance. For Moshe, there was 40 years in Midian, which means strife. And often for us, there are challenging times. But of course, sadly, when things are going well, people don't tend to turn to Jehovah to cry out for him. Um, we read earlier, didn't we, that it was Jehovah who turned the Egyptians against his people. Um, and it was only when they were struggling and going through hard times, as we see, that they cry out to him. She bare him a son and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. And the name of Moshe's first son gives us a brief glimpse into his thoughts at this point. So, the name of Moshe's son. He named him Gershom, foreigner, strainer, for he said, I've been a stranger in a foreign land. So Moshe seems to recognize he's a sojourner, even if the rest of the Israelites had forgotten. All the way back when Moshe went to look upon his brethren, he was beginning to recognize that he was an Egyptian, that he was indeed a stranger in a foreign land. Moshe acknowledges that he's been a stranger. Please note this occurs, then the redemption of Israel begins. There's this recognition, I'm a stranger in a foreign land, coupled with this crying out to Jehovah. The book of Acts also notes that Moshe was indeed a stranger. In Acts 7, then at this, then at this saying, Moshe fled and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And in the chapter on faith, that is in Hebrews 11, talking to the patriarchs in their household, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. David writes in the Psalms about he feels about this earth. He says, I'm a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. This is David, of course, who even lived in the promised land. So what about you? I think most people, well, most people I know, who walk in the truth of a recognition that, well, yeah, strangers in the land, we are, we are definitely, and yeah, have a sense of being exiled, perhaps. It came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. It suggested that when the king died, there would be a time of mourning. Perhaps um, the whole country would shut down. Maybe this was when the children of Israel had time to reflect upon their situation. And they cried out to Jehovah. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. So we heard, and it's the word Shema. He listened intently to the groanings of the people. He remembered. Again, this word we're familiar with, the Zakar, brought to the forefront of his mind. 
had respect. That word is yada. He knew, he acknowledged them. Chapter 3. Moshe was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, um, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. So we led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. I think it's a reference to Sinai, the mountain of God, nearby the rock of Horeb. So from prince and statesman of Egypt to fledgling, fledgling shepherd of Midian, he spent 40 years as a fugitive from justice and he's a nobody on the backside of nowhere in the middle of this wilderness. Moshe the miracle child, Moshe the pampered prince, Moshe the murderer, Moshe the apprentice shepherd of Midian, is 80 years old now, is about to meet the creator of the universe for the first time. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of fire, out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, a bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moshe said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, here I am. Hineini. We've looked at that word before. Moshe turned aside and it was only when Yehovah saw that he turned aside to see that he spoke to him. So Yehovah didn't speak to Moshe till he had his full attention. And what I've got here, we've got what the world sees is an 80-year-old man, not up to much, doesn't even have his own flock of sheep. What does Yehovah see? Yehovah, the sheep herder, out looking for pasture for his father-in-law's sheep, was the shepherd who would lead his father's flock to freedom. Yehovah was able to use Moshe mightily. And we looked at before. Moshe, very meek, more meek than all the people who are on the face of the earth. Um, the Lord looks to the humble, doesn't he? And he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Uh, Yehovah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. <laughs> it's, we're just reading it, aren't we? And um, I just want you for a second to imagine how this must have, how you would experience something like this. You're just out in the middle of nowhere, quietly just going about your business, shepherding these sheep. Next thing you know, the Lord God Almighty is speaking to you and telling you that you're going to go and speak to the Pharaoh. It's probably the last place you want to go. It's the place you've ran away from. And he's telling you why. Because you're going to bring me people out. And it's, I don't know, it's easy to read it and forget that Moshe's this guy. He's this humble fellow as well, isn't he? Now, before this call, Moshe had took upon himself to be delivered, hadn't he? In some sense, when he slew the Egyptian with his bare hands, he saw his people were oppressed and wanted to do something about it. But that's not the kind of deliverance Yehovah's people needed. The kind of deliverance Yehovah wants for his people cannot be wrought by a man, only by Yehovah himself. All man can do is yield himself to Yehovah. It's all about his way, not our way, about bowing the knee to him. And this was the point that Peter missed when he said to Yeshua, oh no, that's not how things are going to pan out. And Yeshua said, get me, I meet Satan. Moshe said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? I can imagine having a similar response myself. And he said, certainly I will be, and it's Echia there with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. So he said, I'm going to bring you back here. 
Moshe said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and they shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. They shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God said to Moshe, I am that I am. In the Hebrew, it's Echia, Asher, Echia. And he said, Thou shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moshe, Thou shalt you say to the children of Israel, Yehovah, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, the God of Yaakov, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Now, Echia, Asher, Echia is a description of the name Yehovah. Jerusalem Targum translates this as, I am he that I was, that I am to be. And uh, we'll just quickly go over the significance of what has just been said. The key to the name of our God, some call Yahweh, some call Yahweh and all that. And we call his name here Yehovah. Um, and we believe the key to his name is found here. Um, and it's found in this word, Echia, first person singular, to be. Where Echia is spelled He, Yud, He, and we find the verb in the Cal conjugation, which is the simplest form. The verb to be can take the following forms of A, he is, Haya, he was, Yehia, he will be. He will be has a yud at the start, as in Hebrew, we have what are known as etan letters, which are prefixes for the Hebrew verbs in their future imperfect forms. Aleph, I will, yud, he will, tav, she will, noon, we will. In this case, it's he will, yud. If we take the yud of yehia, the hov of hove, and the r of haya, then we get the name yehova. Now, to further understand the significance of the name, we must recognize that to the Hebrew mind, there are two worlds. This world and the world to come when the Messiah reigns. And the Yud of Yehia speaks of Yehovah in the world to come. The Hov of Hove speaks of Yehovah in the here and now. And the R of Hayat speaks of Yehovah who existed before creation. The Elohim who always was. We see this idea of the two worlds throughout Scripture. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says Yehovah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yehovah Zavayot, and the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. The first, in other words, before anything was, I was here. The last, in the end, in the age to come, I'll be the only God to exist. In Revelation eleven seventeen, it says, Saying, We give thee thanks, O Yehovah, God Almighty, which art and was, and are to come because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. Here we have the order changed. We've got Hove, he is, which art, Haya, he was, and was, and Yehia, he will be, and art to come. So as we said, Echia, Asher, Echia is a description of the name Yehovah. Echia is the key. Echia, I am now and I will continue to be into the future. I am now and I will be in Hebrew are essentially the same things. And there was a first century AD, a Jewish man named Philo, who lived in Alexandria in Egypt, and he wrote a book called Names. And he read the Bible in Greek and translated the phrase in Exodus 3.14 as, I am he that is. So the Septuagint, which reads, Ego emi ho on, is translated as, I am he that is which is the equivalent of saying, it is my nature to be. He writes to explain to Jews and Gentiles who don't understand Hebrew so that they will know that when Yehovah says, Echia, he means, I am he that is. Effectively, he is telling us that ego, a me, is just Echia, I am the cal form. And John eight fifty eight, Yeshua said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am, ego, a me, which as we've seen is Echia. Yeshua identifies himself as Yehovah. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. I am, again, Ego Ami, which is Echia. Here we also see, is, Yehovah, was, Haya, is to come, Yehia. Yehia. So that's, again, pointing us to his name being Yehovah. Matthew 14, 27. Immediately Yeshua spoke to them saying, 
Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. It is I, again, is ego emi, echia in the Hebrew. This phrase, ego emi, occurs often in the Septuagint when Yehovah is referring to himself, as we see in Isaiah 43.10. You're my witnesses, declares Yehovah, my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, ego emi. Before me no God was formed, in other words, the first, nor there shall be any after me, and the last. Remember, Echia, the first person singular, to be, is not the name, but the key to the name, Yehovah. We can use Yehia, Chove, and Haya in an everyday sentence. For example, he will be in town tomorrow, Yehia. He is, Chove, in town today. He was in town yesterday using Haya. We cannot use Yehovah in an everyday sentence because it is a combination of three forms of the verb to be. Echia, first person singular of the Hebrew verb to be, is the key to Yehovah. If we take the Yud of Yehia, he will be, the Hov of Hove, he is, and the R of Haya, he was, then we get the name Yehovah. Revelation 1 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Which is <laughs> all these um, put together. The Almighty. I am Ego of me, which is Echia. Um, the cal form um, to be. And God said to Moshe, I am that I am, Echia, Asher, Echia. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Echia had sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover to Moshe, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Yehovah, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, God of Yaakov, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. Echia of verse 14 is the key to understanding Yehovah in verse 15. In Hebrew, Echia means I am, but in Hebraic thinking it also means I will continue to be. I will continue to I am, as it were. And a couple of verses earlier, we saw that Moshe had already heard Yehovah refer to himself as Echia when he's concerned about going before Pharaoh. Moshe said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, certainly, Echia, I will be with thee. Yehovah is the source of all being and has being inherent in himself. Everything else is contingent being that derives existence from him. Yehovah, Yod Hei Vav is a combination of three forms of to be. It is a verb. To be like Yehovah, you have to be a verb and not a noun. That is to say in a roundabout way. Your identity is actually what you do. Go and gather the elders of Israel today together and say to them, Yehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I will listen to your voice and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, Yehovah, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yehovah our God. I really like that. <laughs> you've, got, you've got to go to the Pharaoh and say, Yehovah has met with us. <laughs> it's just, what a great way to start your, <laughs> your conversation. And this is how it's going to be. <laughs> I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. And then chapter 4, Moshe answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken to my voice, for they will say, The Lord hasn't appeared to you. Okay, I can see where he's going, but Yehovah has already promised Moshe he has it all in hand. The elders of Israel will listen to you. He's already told them that in Exodus 3.18. Often we fail to hear what Yehovah has said and rather than being led by fear of him, we let worry take over and we fear the wrong things. Jeremiah 32 says, Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And Moshe said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither here too, nor... Since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said to him, 
such an amazing conversation. And who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? <laughs> it's cool. Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. <laughs> I don't know, it's just tickling me. Like, uh, it's good, isn't it? He said, oh, my Lord, please send somebody else. <laughs> what a remarkable conversation. And Jehovah said to Adam, go into the wilderness to meet Moshe. So he sent him and he met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. I think that's really lovely. That he's like, I'm not, I'm going to send somebody with you. You're, I'm gonna, yeah, go on. I'll send your brother to go and help you. I think it's pretty cool. I remember... When I was first talking about the Lord and the truth when I was in that church, when I met JP and when I realized, wow, that he's also understood the truth. What an amazing blessing that was. And has been ever since, obviously. Moshe told Aharon and all the words of Yehovah with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. This is his brother. He's probably, what? <laughs> And Moshe and Aharon went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that Jehovah had spoken to Moshe and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that Jehovah had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshipped. So the people believed it happened just as Jehovah said. It's all about his way, not our way. And we think things are going to pan out. No. It's all about bowing the knee to him. Two seemingly inconsequential Hebrew brothers. These brothers, unlike Pharaoh, who have names, as did the midwives. Well, no human being alive could have understood it at the time. What these two Hebrews were talking about and doing will turn out to be far more important than anything going on in the mind or in the courts of the new Pharaoh. Pharaoh, seemingly all-powerful, is about to meet with these seemingly powerless Hebrews. The two appointed witnesses of Jehovah. 1 Corinthians 1 says this, The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. To God belongs all the glory. Exodus 5. And afterward Moshe and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. What a statement. Who is the Lord that I should Shema, his voice. And we can plainly see the arrogance and stupidity of the Pharaoh. Yet, there are many that make the same declaration with the choices they make and how they live their lives. Who is the Lord that I should Shema, his voice? And they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. <laughs> As he was instructed to, let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. The king of Egypt said to them, Why do you, Moshe and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many. You make them rest from the burdens, and where there is, you make them ship out from the burdens. I don't know whether this is a reference to the weekly Sabbath, but Pharaoh is not happy. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foreman shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are all idle. Uh, therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. So Moshe, synonymous with the Torah, comes with the words of Yehovah. Pharaoh's response, disregard the words of Yehovah that are brought via Moshe. Who is Yehovah that I should shema his voice? Does his response sound familiar? This, by and large, to me, sounds a lot like the mainstream Christian message. 
The same message aimed at those whose fear of God is not driven by an appreciation of who Yevaret is, but rather by an appreciation of the self. They look to Jesus and say, what the law? He fulfilled it, so I don't have to. And they're happy to throw away what James describes as the perfect law of liberty. Consider the words of David. Oh, how I love your Lord. It is my meditation all the day. And consider what Jehovah said of this man. I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. See also 1 Samuel 13, 14. Mainstream Christian message. Disregard the words of Jehovah that are brought via Moshe. Who is Jehovah that I should shema his voice? To so shema his voice, as we've seen, is to walk in his truth, to keep and cherish and guard his commandments. So the message is, who is Jehovah that I should practice righteousness? I don't have to. Jesus did that for me. I've put this up a few times in the past. If obedience is how we show God our love and obeying the Torah is bondage, is loving God then bondage? If you love me, you will keep my commandments, said Yeshua. Who is Jehovah that I should shimma his voice? Or to put it another way, who is Jehovah that I should love him? So many calling themselves God-fearing, but they do not fear Jehovah. They have no idea as to who he is. When they hear about who he is, they dismiss the truth as well as lying words. Oh no, no one has to have anything to do with that. Thank you very much. And most arguments always boil down to, well, Paul said, and Peter warns about this, in 2 Peter 3, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. It's the ignorance and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Okay. <clears throat> you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. So, <clears throat> basically, he's talking about Paul writing things that people twist um, to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. They'll twist them to their own destructions too. They're unstable. Don't get carried away with the error of who? Lawless people, people who are disregarding Jehovah's Torah and lose your own stability. Don't end up like them who twist the word. Something Paul said that is not difficult to understand. Romans 3.31, do we then overthrow this law by faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Nothing confusing about that. This is not a verse that's often quoted. Many have reduced the word of the Creator to nothing more than a bunch of stories to tell the kids when you're not asking them what they want from Father Christmas. Um, but somebody asked me recently what you would do to teach children the word. Um, um, and uh, you know, are there any great resources out there and stuff? And I told him about when JP was first asked to do Sunday school when we were together in that church, we got asked to leave. Um, and the idea in Sunday school was often to, I don't know, draw pictures and that was arc with a giraffe's head sticking out and make up some story or other. And um, <laughs> JP did his Sunday school class and actually gave a really cool Bible lesson, <laughs> which was probably more substantial and meaty than what was getting taught in the main building. And he said the children actually responded to it because it wasn't watered down in any way. It was just the truth spoken plainly. And what <clears throat> a lot of people do is they disregard the word in some way and they turn it into nonsense like this and... But the word is powerful. The word is what is at work in us as believers as it transforms us and it changes us. And the best you can do for your children is to read it and understand it and explain it to them um, in ways that you know that they will uh, appreciate. But um, yeah, many people have took the word of God and they have no respect for it whatsoever. And I know the person who asked really references the word and his question was coming from a place of a real yearning um, to have a, his, his child appreciate the word as much as he does. But these people who would say, <clears throat> you know, cast away these lying words, who is Jehovah that I should shimar his voice? 
And they have turned the gospel message into some nonsense. And we used to use a phrase a lot, which used to offend lots of people. We used to say, oh, right, yeah, Disney Jesus. Because it's this, I don't know, they've tried to make Jesus or Yeshua rather palatable to people who have no fear of God yet just want to be told everything's going to be great for them. And it's really awful. So the warning. This now also that in the last days, perilous times shall come, and men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce braces, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, wow, Okay, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He's warning you about people who might come having a form of godliness. This might be people that you come across in the um, the world of Christianity. For of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We've seen that Yeshua describes the word as the truth. The law is described as the truth in Psalm 119. Now as Janice and Jambres which stood in Moshe, which you'll see next week, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So Janice and Jambres which stood in Moshe, synonymous with the Torah. These men also resist the truth, which as we've seen it stands for his word. And when they come speaking against Torah or Moshe, even if they come with their signs and wonders, don't pay them any heed. They are nothing more than men. Corrupt minds reprobate concern in the faith. Deuteronomy 6, 13 to 14. It is Jehovah your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. But unfortunately, um, around um, us, there are all these other crazy gods, these fabrications that people have brought and put the name Jesus to. The Jesus of mainstream Christianity is another God, the Lamb of God who came to take away the laws of Moses. He's done away with the righteousness described in the Old Testament as an everlasting righteousness. So Moshe, synonymous with the, word, with the Torah, comes with the words of Yehovah. Pharaoh's response, disregard the words of Yehovah that are brought via Moshe. Who is Yehovah that I should shema his voice? Again, I'd ask, does this response sound familiar? We can clearly see how Pharaoh's response is manifested in mainstream Christianity. But what about you who claim to keep the Torah? Do you disregard um, Yehovah's words? If you do, remember this, you shall not carry the name of the Lord your God falsely, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who carries his name falsely. Um, to go around calling yourself somebody who walks in the truth, who does disregard Jehovah's word, um, and whose attitude and actions speak, who is Jehovah that I should obey him? And be warned. As we've seen, the fear of Yehovah is totally connected to loving him. Many people calling themselves Torah keepers don't fear Yehovah. They fear the consequences of living a sinful life, but it is a life they do not want to repent of. They hold on to sin and they excuse it. They do not love Yehovah. By their actions, they respond just like the Pharaoh. Who is Yehovah that I should shema his voice? And if this, you might think in some way, um, reflects who you are then you certainly need to repent don't be like the Pharaoh who is Yehovah that I should shimar his voice this is a man who will see the mighty works of Yehovah yet still he will not fear Yehovah again this is because fearing Yehovah comes from an understanding and appreciation of who he is or rather the fear of Yehovah Psalm 86, teach me your way, O Yehovah, that I may walk in your truth and your word. Unite my heart to fear your name. Teach me your way that I may walk according to your word. In other words, that I might fear you. And the Parsha ends, the very beginning of Exodus 6. 
Yelva said to Moshe, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. That sets us up nicely for what is to come in the Torah. We'll see Yehovah bringing deliverance to his people. So, we'll come to a close now, Deuteronomy 6. Take care lest you forget Yehovah who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is Yehovah, your God, that you shall fear. It is a call to righteousness and it's a call to remember. We're commanded to remember these events and we are to remember what they point us to. To remember is a powerful thing. Shall we pray? Um, Lord, um, the, your word is incredible. Um, and what you've done for us is incredible. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't displease you um, by failing to be a people that remember, as you've asked us to. Um, and if we've seemed in that way, like, and I ask, Lord, that you might look upon us mercifully because... Um, what you have done for us is incredible. Um, and we should be a people not only you remember, but a people who um, are full of thanksgiving. I thank you, Lord, that you did call us out of Egypt, out of the world. And um, I thank you for the hope that we have in the promises that you have in the world, in the word for us. And Lord, I thank you for your grace, for your great mercy. I thank you, Lord, that you made a way for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And I just pray, Lord, if there is anybody who's kidding themselves and is acting like the Pharaoh and not walking in your ways, pretending he isn't really acting like he should when you have when there's fear of you Lord I really I don't understand that people would want to do this but I ask Lord that you would convict them that they would see themselves in the likes of the Pharaoh in scripture and realize how foolish that they are but also, Lord, that they'd be overcome with a desire to please you and a realization of how wonderful you are that they might love you and cherish your commands. Lord, it is such a blessing that we get to fellowship together. And I thought about it today. And now I think, Lord, of the people who might be sat isolated I just, I ask, Lord, that you and your great kindness would help them to feel like they belong as part of your body, as part of your people, that they'd be comforted, Lord, to know this. And Lord, maybe for those who might have to take the bread and the wine, like sat on their own, Lord, I just pray a blessing upon them and I pray, Lord, that you'd be pleased by what you see, when you see your people come to honor you and to remember all that you've done. Thank you, Lord. Amen.